sing, my hope is built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' love and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. But holy trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing that again. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend. But holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong, and the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord. When darkness, when darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within. holds within the veil Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm He is Lord Lord of all verse 3 when He shall come Rest in His righteousness alone, a faultless man before the throne. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak may strong, with the Savior's love through. paper if the slides aren't working or do they work it okay they're not working so welcome um and you know uh, we're glad you're here we're here you, we're here we're you're here i'm tongue-tied already that's a good that's a good start so uh, ushers will be happy to help you out if you have any questions uh, uh regarding things here uh, we have giving boxes in the back uh bathrooms located that way so if, you, if you're new with us we're glad that you're here and and uh, if you have any questions feel free to ask someone out there with a name badge they'll be able to help you get in the right direction 
Um, so coming up July 27th, ah, there's a slide, a church in the park. So it's kind of where a bunch of the church bodies and SDK to gather as one and uh, just celebrate and worship together. Um, so that's going to be July 27th, 10 a.m., uh, just at Clackamas River Elementary in the field between kind of the two schools uh, there. So things to bring, uh, Bible chairs, blanket, uh, well, it says to bring shade and drink. So if you can control the shade, um, you know, by an umbrella, that'd probably be good, too. Um, and there's going to be a potluck afterwards, so uh, it should be a great time just to get together and kind of a community uh, event there. It's, it's always a lot of fun. Um, next thing on the list here is the Serve the City Cleanup Day. Um, so that's July 19th from 9 a.m. To, to 1 p.m. Um, so many hands make the work light, so if you have a few extra uh, hours that day, uh, just come and make that uh, you know, a little easier job. It says on here that any specialized equipment like wheelbarrows and bags, I didn't know those were considered specialized, but um, if uh, those are going to be provided, so just come and as well as snacks and water will be too, so just come and help out. It'll be a, a good time just to uh, get ready for the summer celebration, uh, make the town look a little better. And then today, right after the service, uh, we have a covenant membership meeting in Potluck, um, so uh, just be ready for that, uh, 1230, and uh, Hopefully we've got this figured out already since today, but bring a main dish, a salad, dessert, um, and let the office know if you need childcare. Probably a little late for that, but um, uh, regardless, uh, please meet over there at 12.30 after the second service, and we'll go over a few fun things that we get to do as covenant members. And I believe that's it on the list. So with that, um, why don't you guys go ahead and stand, and we'll pray, and we'll turn it back over to the worship team. So God, just thank you for this morning. Uh, thank you for bringing each and every one of us here. Um, Lord, I just pray that you would be in the center of everything we are doing this morning, whether it's worship, uh, speak through Brent, Lord, as he uh, presents the word to us. God, just pray that you would be glorified among anything else that happens this morning, that you would be lifted up. And Lord, so I just pray that uh, you would give us uh, listening ears and hearts that are open and willing to learn. In Jesus' name. Your blood speaks a better word than all the empty claims I've heard upon this earth speaks righteousness for me and stands in my defense Jesus it's your blood let's sing that one more time your blood speaks a better word all the empty claim I've heard upon this earth speaks righteousness for me stands in my defense Jesus it's your blood and what can wash away our sin what can Nothing but your blood, King Jesus. Your cross testifies in grace, tells of the Father's heart to make for us a way. How boldly we approach. Not earthly confidence, it's only by your blood. Your cross testifies in grace, tells of the Father's heart to make for us a way. Now boldly we approach, not earthly confidence, it's only by your blood. And what can wash away our sin? What 
Just lift our voices. What can wash away? And what can wash away our sin? What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can wash us? Pure as snow, welcomed as the friends of God. Nothing but your blood, nothing but your blood, King Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that. As we just continue to worship the Lord, we want to read some scripture together. Isaiah chapter 6 is where we'll be spending some time. So as it goes up on the screens, we'd like to just read this out loud together just as a way of worshiping the Lord. Here we go, out loud together. Isaiah 6, 1 through 7 says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Amen. Came sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing, love so Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. Lord of all, his 
body the bread his body the bread his blood the wine broken and poured out all for love the whole earth trembled and the veil was torn love so amazing love so Messiah, the name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from hell. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. Let's proclaim all our hope is in you. All our hope is in you. All our hope is in you. All the glory to you, God. Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, let's do that one more time, Jesus Messiah, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. Children, it's good to have you here, but you can be dismissed down to children's ministry right now. That's up through sixth grade right now, so God bless you as you go. Be encouraged as you learn and grow in the Word. The most important thing that you can know about me... is my view of God. It's more important than my political views. It's more important than any moral stands or ethical stands that I have because my view of God, your view of God, who God is, what He is like, determines everything that happens in our lives. It shapes our choices. So our passage today in Isaiah 6 gives us a beautiful view of God. It's a challenging view. As I thought about it, as you came today to worship God, what is this God like that you've come to worship? What are his attributes? What are his qualities? It would be interesting if we could all just have a little glimpse into one one another's minds about this God that we've come to worship. Let's pray today that as we look at Scripture that we would have a very clear understanding as we look at Isaiah 6 about the wonder and beauty and holiness of the God that we worship. Father, as we look into your word today, we do uh, submit ourselves to your word and we submit ourselves even to the power of the Holy Spirit as he's the teacher among us today. Thank you for your grace that allows us to even 
ponder these things about you that are far beyond us. So, Lord, we're expectant that you can and will speak truth to each one of our hearts, and even our hearts as we gather together as a church family. We pray, as always, in Jesus. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, as we've just read it, starts with an earthly reality. It says in Isaiah 6, verse, verse 1, in the year of King Uzziah's death. It's an interesting way to start the chapter because uh, there's just a few times in Scripture where it actually uh, connects what's going on or what's being said to a particular historical time frame. So there must be something very significant. This isn't just a little Bible trivia fact that you can put in your bag of trivia knowledge about this king and something that happened at his death. What is it about this king, this man, and, and this time in the history of people that Scripture says it's important to know this? Well, you can read about this particular king, Uzziah, in the books of Second Chronicles and Second Kings chapter it's actually 2 Chronicles 26, 2 Kings chapter 15. If you are reading in 2 Kings, his name is not Uzziah there, but it's another name that's used, and that's not rare in Scripture. It's Azariah. Here's the Reader's Digest version. Uzziah became king when he was 16 years old, and he reigned for 52 years. It was the golden years in the, in, in the time of Israel because during those 52 years, God blessed and prospered Israel, his people, in many ways. He gave them stability. He gave them prosperity. He gave them even, even power in amongst the nations. This was before Assyria began to come into power. This was a good time when this man was the king from, from just about any perspective. 52 years is a long time to be king. Scripture would record this king as one of the good kings that followed after the heart of God and led the people after God. And yet what's really interesting, is toward the end of Uzziah's reign, well, like tends to happen with leaders that lead for a long time and have a certain level of prosperity, pride began to creep in. And so Uzziah did something that he shouldn't do. He went into the very temple of God and he burned incense before God, which is a very good thing to do, but it's not his place. That's the place of the high priest. So he started to step into the areas thinking that he had authority and power that he was not granted. And at that point, the high priest confronted him. You can read all of this in those history books. It's a great story. It's kind of a sad story the way it ends. But they confront him, the high priest along with 80 other priests confront him in the temple as he's burning these incense and yet he's resistant. And he says, no, what I've done is right and I have the authority to do that. And even as he's saying that, God steps in and strikes him with leprosy. At that moment, it shows up on his forehead and then covered his whole body. So for the last 15 years of Uzziah's life, he continues to reign, and there's continued to be prosperity, but he's in isolation, as all lepers were at that time. This is the earthly reality. This king, Uzziah, is now dead. No doubt when Uzziah died, the people were a bit shaken because this had been a long reign. Even though it did end poorly, this had been a long reign. A time of stability and prosperity and power, and no doubt the people were wondering, what's next? Who's the next king, and, and how will it go? And Will we end up less than we really are now? See, now this king is dead. The king that had reigned for so long is dead. And no doubt the people were shaken. Maybe even Isaiah was shaken a little bit as the prophet, saying, what's going to happen next? You know, it's interesting how our earth reality can soon very easily dominate everything that happens. 
these things that happen in our life. I'm just thinking of Israel at this point when Uzziah is now dead. If they're saying, man, can anything ever good happen now? Because now everything is going to be a mess. I wonder if they just went all to the negative. This is the earthly reality. How's your earthly reality today? How's life? Is it a mess? Some of our lives are. It's just funny. This is, this is a little bit humorous, but uh, as we were preparing for our gathering just this morning, Isaac and Lindsay got here a little bit late, and that doesn't normally happen, but the first thing Isaac said when he came in as we were preparing for the time, he says, sorry I'm late, but the dog just pooped all over himself. <laughs> How's that for an earthly reality? See, it's those sort of things, and that's a small thing, but, but there's all these big things that happen in life that just shake our world and says, man, what a mess. But is there another reality? It's interesting, as Scripture states this earthly reality, all of a sudden then it goes to the spiritual reality. Look where it goes next. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now this is the spiritual reality. This is now what Isaiah sees in the spiritual realm, that even though King Uzziah is now dead, there's another king, right? Not an earthly king, a spiritual king. How easy it is for us to lose sight of what is the spiritual reality in the midst of the real messy, earthly reality. Let's look at this spiritual reality. It says, I saw the Lord. The Lord, that's an interesting word in the Hebrew. The, uh, God communicates himself through various names in Scripture. and that, So we know that the name Yahweh and we know the name El or El, El, Elyon. This is an interesting word. It's Adonai. He says, I saw Adonai. And again, let's just talk about that word. If you take the first half of the word, the first four letters, Adon, it simply means master or Lord. And throughout the Old Testament, that word Adon could be used to refer to human leaders and human masters. But then there's a couple letters put on at the end, which in the Hebrew is this suffix, which intensifies the word. So what, what Isaiah sees, or who Isaiah sees, is not just the Lord, or not just the Master, but the Supreme Lord, the Supreme Master, the one that rules over everything and everyone. It's, an, it's, a, it's a strong stress on the sovereignty of this Lord that Isaiah sees. This is a sovereign king. And that truth is hammered home because that sovereign king is doing what? Sitting on the throne. The place of power, the place of control, the place where the authority comes from. So again, let me connect the two. In the earthly realm, the king is now dead. But in the spiritual realm, the king is where? Sitting on the throne. What a beautiful contrast. The king is not, con he's not concerned. He doesn't seem to be out of control. He's not scrambling somehow to find a replacement for Uzziah. He seems to be in absolute control as Isaiah sees the master, the king, the Lord. The earthly king has died, but the spiritual king is sovereignly in control. And notice it goes on that this is an awesome king. He's lofty, he's exalted, his glory fills the temples. Like this is an amazing sight. This king, this Lord, this sovereign king. Notice the seraphim. That word seraphim, it, it literally means fiery ones that have been created, and they have six wings, but only two of the wings are used for flying. What are the other wings for? To cover themselves. Imagine this. These are creatures that have been created specifically for this purpose as they're around the throne of God. We see them also in Revelation chapter 4. But 
In the presence of this awesome God, they cover themselves, they cover their eyes as if, as if to communicate, we can't even gaze upon this amazing king. They cover their feet as if to say, we're not even able to stand in the presence of this king. Remember when Moses stood in the presence of the Lord in the burning bush, the first thing God told Moses was what? Take off your feet, you're on holy ground. See that same sort of thing. He wasn't even worthy to be there. The spiritual reality reveals that there is a sovereign king, an awesome king. And these spiritual beings around this king are, even have the sense that we're not even worthy to be here to even put our foot down in his presence. But notice the repeated words of these beings. And one called out to another and said, what? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. This is a holy king. What does that mean? Why do they repeat that? You know, when we think of the word holy, when we translate that, we think of words like righteousness or purity or goodness. But we need to understand there's a lot more to what it means to be holy as it's repeated here than we usually think about. To be holy means to be set apart for anything that is common, to be absolutely different than anything that is normal, no doubt anything that is profane. Holy means in this context and whenever it refers to God that God is unlike anything that we can experience in this world. We can't compare his holiness to something which makes a sermon about the holiness of God very difficult. Because there's nothing in this world to compare with the holiness of God. Holy means otherness. So different than anything that any human could even comprehend. Holy is the way God always is. Holiness doesn't conform with any standard in the world Holiness is the standard by which everything else is compared. All that he does is holy. All of his other attributes flow from this intrinsic nature of God that he is holy. Interesting, Psalms 89, verse 35, you can write that down and read it later. It actually says that all of his promises he makes are based on his holiness. Amos Chapter 4, verse 2 says, all of the judgments that he makes are based on his holiness. And notice these seraphim don't say he's holy. What do they say? He's holy, holy, holy. Now some would say, well, that's a reference to the triune God that was even present here. And I I just think that's a little bit off track. It's a way in the Hebrew of emphasizing something to the nth degree. These seraphim are saying, and it's translated in the Hebrews, that God is holy beyond anything that anybody can imagine. And I'm lost at this moment to try to describe what that actually means. So the best thing we can do is look how Isaiah responds to it. The best way to understand what holy means is when people are exposed to holy, how they respond to it. What does holiness prompt in a human being? What does holiness as it's seen elicit in the human realm? Here it is, a very humble confession. Read the yellow with me. Woe is me, I am ruined. A very humble response. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Woe is me. Now we know woe because we coupled woe last week, didn't we? Woe doesn't, it's not what you say to a horse, okay? We talked about that. Woe means doom, woe means dread. Notice he doesn't say, wow, this is cool. What's he say? 
Woe, I am doomed in the presence of this holy God. So you understand a vision, a clear understanding of the holy, awesome, majestic God like Isaiah has here prompts a humble confession of his desperation and his sinfulness. That word ruined. Some translations have undone, lost, emptied. Could be translated destroyed. I am destroyed at this moment in the presence of God. So let me say this again. An understanding, a vision of a holy God that Isaiah has here prompts a humble confession of desperation and a confession of sinfulness. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend some time right here because as you go through Scripture, without exception, without exception, this is always the response to a holy God as it's revealed in the pages of Scripture. There is no other response before God. In Judges chapter 6, when Gideon was faced with God, he is terrified. He is absolutely terrified. So the first thing that God says to Gideon is, don't worry, you're not going to die. It's the first thing he hears from God. Don't worry, you're not dead yet. In Judges chapter 13, a man named Manoah And his wife, they encounter God in this very clear revelation. And the first thing they do in Scripture is to fall on their face. And then Manoah says to his wife, I love you, dear, but we're dead. He didn't say, I love you, dear. I added that part. But he he, he says to his wife, he says, we're dead. We're We're dead. There's nothing else to say. Even Job Job, now what's interesting about Job is Job, by God's standard, actually says in Scripture that he's more righteous than anybody else on the earth. This is Job. And let me just show you this. When Job encounters God, he says this. I heard of you by the hearing of the ear, and now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. This is Job. More righteous than anybody. That's what God says. And yet when Job really sees God during this time, he says, I I despise myself. Amazing as we see this in Scripture. In the New Testament, when the Apostle John is given this very clear revelation of the heavenlies and those things that are yet future, when this whole revelation starts in Chapter 1, verse 17, here's what we read. When I saw him, seen Christ, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid, you're not dead yet. Do not be afraid, I'm the first and I am the last. You see, when God is seen accurately in his holiness, this is always the response. I'm a dead man, I'm undone, I'm ruined, I fall down, I repent, I'm not going to make it. So as we look at the weight of Scripture in this area, one could rightly ask us, have we ever understood this God as Scripture presents us? Because have we ever had that response before God? God, I'm dead before you. I despise myself before you. I wonder if we're guilty of creating a God that is much more tolerable than really the God that Scripture reveals to us. Even in the Gospels, bear with me as I make this point, even in the Gospels when Jesus takes on human form so he can dwell among us and and his glory and his holiness is very much veiled, Every once in a while in the Gospels, it seeps out. And the the people around Jesus see who this man really is. In Mark chapter 4, 
We read of the account when the disciples were on the Sea of Galilee and remember the storm came up and they were terrified because they thought they were going to die and Jesus shows up. And Jesus says, hush, be still. Now you would think at that point they would just be very calm that Jesus is present, but look what Scripture says. Jesus said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? In verse 41, then they became very much afraid. You see that? They became very much afraid and they said to one another, who is this guy that's in our boat? They were terrified at that moment because that holiness and that power had seeped out in a beautiful way. Another encounter on the Sea of Galilee in Luke chapter 5. The disciples were out all night fishing. They had caught nothing and Jesus shows up like he loves to do. He shows up and he says, throw your nets on the other side. So they do, you know the story, right? They had so many fish, they could hardly get it in. The boat began to sink. And you would think they would say, man, this Jesus is cool. Look how Peter responds. When Simon Peter saw that, he fell at Jesus' feet saying, what? Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Amazing response. A certainly an appropriate response when Peter again sees that this is, this is the God of the Old Testament that's here in the boat with us and producing this fish and he is brought face to face with his own sinfulness yet again. So let me say without an exception the human response in the pages of scripture when God is seen accurately in his holiness is one of dread, fear, repentance, and humbleness. Church, we can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned and God entered into the garden again. Where were they? They were hiding because they were afraid now of this holy God. Now, some of you might be saying, oh, wait a minute now. What about the grace of God? What about the mercy of God? What, a, what about the love of God? Isn't God all of those things as well? And I say yes. Thank God that he is. Amen? Thank God that he is those things. And, and maybe that's the point. See, the reason that we value the grace of God so much is because we recognize how much we need it in light of his holiness. The reason we cling to his love so tightly is because his holiness gives us no other option. And the reason we cry out for his mercy is because it's the only response we have to being dead before a holy God. But here's, here's the warning, church. When we separate the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, from the holiness of God. Well, if we do that, then, then grace becomes somewhat optional, doesn't it? And love becomes quite sentimental, and, and mercy becomes superfluous, absolutely unnecessary, because it's not in the context of the holiness of God that destroys people. So are we seeing God accurately today? Have you come to worship that God today? I wonder if churches are preaching, uh, well, instead of preaching the God of the Bible, they're preaching kind of an airbrushed version of God that softens all those, quote, unattractive edges so that he's more approachable. Understand the the Jesus that we're here to worship today, Scripture says this, is the King of kings, he is the Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality, and he dwells in what? Unapproachable light. And we've come to worship him. But he dwells in unapproachable light, and so the only way that we can worship him as he extends his grace and he extends his mercy from his holiness and he extends his love and in a response to that, we come to a humble confession saying, Lord, we recognize who we are compared to your holiness.
What happens? What happens when people actually recognize, they see God's holiness, they recognize their sinfulness, they recognize the doom that is before them when they're in presence of God? What, what happens when they actually see that and they humbly confess? Well, Scripture tells us in Isaiah that God graciously provides. Look at this. So Isaiah had said, Woe is me, I'm undone. And then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs, and he touched my mouth. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity has been taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Did God stop being holy? No. He didn't stop being holy, but that gracious provision comes out of a holy God to make provision for Isaiah. So that Isaiah isn't consumed, but instead God sends this burning coal from the seraphim to consume the sin so that Isaiah is not consumed. And that's a beautiful imagery, this burning coal. Something that if somebody brought it to you, what would be your first response? I'm going to back away. No, don't burn me. But, but the seraphim takes the tongs and, and goes to the altar, and again, this is beautiful imagery, and he brings it to Isaiah, and, and Isaiah doesn't seem to back away. He actually seems to recognize that there's something that he needs there. So this burning, this burning coal is placed on his lips. The lips that he just confessed earlier were what? Unclean. The lips that in the New Testament Jesus said speak things that are connected to our heart. And it says your iniquity is taken away. Let's look at that word iniquity. It, it, it means things that are twisted or distorted or bent. Then he says your sin is forgiven. That word sin is kind of compares to the New Testament word sin, which means to miss the mark, to fall short of of the standard and 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 what is the standard the holiness of god that's the standard and so in this beautiful imagery this burning coal comes to provide provision from a holy god so that isaiah can experience cleansing of his sin and the distortion and the de, and the, the the deception and even the perversion that might be in his mind is taken away so I hope you don't miss church the very clear connection between that burning coal and the work of Jesus Christ don't miss that very clear connection there the burning coal that comes from the altar is a beautiful image of the cleansing that can only come from God as he extends it to those who would receive it Isaiah was powerless, get this, Isaiah was powerless to do anything in the presence of this God. He could not fix himself. He was desperate for something, and God was the one who did what Isaiah could never do, and God sent what? A burning coal to bring cleansing. We as well are all powerless to do anything in our ruined condition before God. We cannot fix ourselves. We are desperate for something that God would do, and so God does it, amen? He does what we can never do. He sends this one from the throne. God sends a Savior. So God, in his holiness, has provided a way of cleansing and forgiveness in the person and work of Jesus Christ. This is the good news, amen? Yes. That wasn't loud enough. This is the good news, amen? Yes. We got to understand that that is the good news. The good news for Isaiah was that this holy, consuming God did not consume him but instead provided a burning coal that his sin could be taken care of and could be consumed.
Notice that Isaiah does not resist the burning coal. But Isaiah, humbly, because he recognizes he can do nothing else, receives that. So we call the gospel good news, right? Is it good news? Is it good news? It is good news. But understand this. The reason the gospel is good news is because we see the holiness of God and our desperation and our sinfulness before him. That's why the gospel is not just good news, but great news. But we gut the gospel of its power when we separate it from God's holiness. So if we declare the gospel that God has sent a Savior in Jesus, but we separate that from the holiness of God, then then the gospel is no longer good news. It's just news. It's just information that can be received or not because, well, God is God. See, the gospel can be easily rejected and is easily rejected when we are not confronted with our sinfulness. And we're often not confronted with our sinfulness when we preach and we somehow worship a God that is not holy, that consumes us and would consume us had it not been for his grace. Look at Romans chapter 1 verse 16. It says, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation. To everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it, that's the gospel, The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Notice what the gospel reveals. It reveals the righteousness of God. The gospel reveals the justice of God. The gospel reveals the holiness of God. So the gospel can only be rightly understood when we understand God's holiness. Because if we don't understand his holiness, we don't understand our own sinfulness. Church, may we never soften the gospel by presenting a God that is less than how the Bible presents him. Thinking somehow in doing that that we're making the gospel more attractive. May we never overemphasize the grace and the mercy and the love of God and neglect the holiness of God. Now think of this. If his grace, mercy, and love are what draw us to him, but he's not a holy God, one would ask, well, do I even need to be drawn to this holy God? Is this a, whole, is this a God that I even need to consider if he's not lofty and exalted and glorious? So what happens next in this story? Isaiah makes this humble confession because he's seen a holy God and this holy God provides a gracious provision. And next we see this wonderful call, this gracious call. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. So now the master, the king, calls Isaiah to serve and There's some debate about when this vision actually happened, if it actually should be placed right at the beginning of the book of Isaiah, or maybe this is a recall of Isaiah, a recommissioning of Isaiah at this point in the story. Regardless, there's two very beautiful aspects in that gracious call. Notice the us. Who will go for us? I just want to point this out. This is one of the many places in the Old Testament that the triune God is clearly revealed. Who will go for us? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in their fullness calling Isaiah to serve them, to speak for them. And what's beautiful is in the New Testament, when John, the Apostle John, quotes the message that Isaiah is given to preach, notice what John says. This is in John 21, 14. Isaiah said this, talking about what's at the end of chapter 6, because he saw, what? Jesus' glory and spoke about him. So even the Apostle John recognizes that really what Isaiah is seeing in this beautiful vision is Jesus himself, the one that's seated on the throne, 
the one that we see clearly in the book of Revelation. So notice again the response, here I am, send me. Is there any other appropriate response than that? Think about it. When God, this holy God, says, whom shall I send? Is there any other appropriate response to say, Lord, send me. I submit to you. Use me as you want. Here I am. Send me. There really is no other appropriate response, but yet there are poor responses recorded throughout Scripture. Remember in the New Testament, Jesus would often call people to follow him, and some actually did drop everything to follow, and others says, now, I have some other things to do. Can you imagine that? This holy God calling us to follow him, and we say, eh, I have some other things that are just a little more high up on my list of to-dos. I have to go talk to a few people, say goodbye to them. I, I, have, I have some people I actually need to bury, and Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. In other words, follow me. It's the most important thing you can do. So it's a privilege we have, church, to say, here I am, send us. Here we are, send us. And for Isaiah, that meant a very specific prophetic role. For others, for us, maybe it's not the prophetic role. Maybe it's just stepping into areas that God says, just follow me and trust me and take a step of faith and see what I will do if you'll just be obedient and submissive to me. In my own personal experience, I know for many of you, when we when we by faith and by his grace actually do that, the whole world looks completely different. We see things like we've never seen them before when we'll simply say, as Isaiah said, Lord, here am I. Send me if that's your desire. Picture for a moment in your mind a funnel. I'll give you some moments to do that. A funnel, you know, a funnel looks like it's big and it goes down, okay? Picture that funnel. As you think of that funnel as, as, as an encounter with God, some people, as they think about following wholeheartedly about Jesus, think of entering in through the large part of this funnel, and life becomes very, very narrow and restrictive. And to be honest, I thought of life in following Jesus much like that through most of my growing up years. That if I'm really going to follow Jesus, then life becomes very narrow and restrictive and I don't have any fun at all. Anybody else ever think that? Yeah. But really, in reality, if we understand it accurately, the funnel is turned upside down. And we enter in through the narrow way. And then life is seen for what it really is in all of its glory, and all of its splendor, and all of its wonder, because we entered through the narrow, and we experienced then what Jesus says is abundant life. So what end of the funnel are you at today would be another way to ask that. How are you thinking about this thing of following Jesus as it becomes very narrow and restricting, or does it become beautiful and grand and glorious and more than you can even imagine? So three questions as we bring this to an end. Here's the first one. So today as you sit here, has your earthly reality blinded you to the spiritual realities? Whatever you walked in here with that is your earthly reality, I want to remind you that there is still the king that's seated on the throne that's lofty and exalted. Amen? That spiritual reality is what needs to motivate us as we go out of here, not the messy earthly reality that happens at times. Second question, have you and I, have we created God in our own image? Have we softened his holiness and tamed his sovereignty and muted his power because it just is easier that way? Or are we really understanding God as he's presented in Scripture? Awesome in holiness. 
Third question is, is God asking you today, who will go? Is God in some ways asking you to just take a step of obedience in some area of your life? And, and if he is, will you say, here I am, I'll go, I'll obey, I'll submit, I'll, I'll follow you, Lord, and I'll expect you to show up in beautiful ways and experience life even more fully. May God bring us to respond appropriately to the holy God, even as I did, Isaiah did, amen? amen? May he bring us to that point so that even as we leave here, we could be used by him, even as Isaiah was. Well, the musicians will come. They'll just help us respond even in song to God's holiness. into our time of worship. I'd like you just to spend a second and we'll just kind of close our eyes and so often we do make ourselves so busy that we forget to even try to hear of whether or not God is calling us. And so even right now this morning, Lord, as we come and we worship and we glorify you, God, I pray that you would allow us to sit and to soak in the mercy that you have for each one of us, God. And that in that time, Lord, that we would allow ourselves to be used by you, Lord. I see the sing that together. I see the Lord. I see the the uh-huh. 
Revelation chapter 5, beautiful image of a holy God. I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. And then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, read it with me, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Amen.
We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He Together we sing Everyone sing Holy is the Lord God Almighty The earth is filled with His glory Holy is the Lord God Almighty The earth is filled with His glory We stand and lift up our hands We stand and lift up our for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we've, we've read again in Scripture just about who you are, and we're humbled by that. And Lord, we recognize again how desperate we are for your grace every day, for your mercy to be extended to us. And Lord, we're reminded as well that you've told us that uh, we are to be holy, even as you are holy. Lord, I confess that's a disconnect in my mind often about how, how to, to, to have your holiness become more a part of me. But Lord, we submit to you again, praying that you would do that wonderful work of transformation in us, your people so that as we leave this place, we could represent you well, and that you would be pleased even to speak through us, communicate your love, your grace, and even your holiness through us as your people. So we submit ourselves to you with expectation in Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless today.